What's up, everyone? Hope you're doing well. It's a little uh, little rainy here this morning. Get some additional lights on here. We finally hit the rainy season last night, and it came in with a big crash, boom, bang. Uh, we got woken up at three o'clock in the morning. It's about six right now, with torrential downpour. Windows, you know, water coming in all the windows. Tree branches falling down all around us from the woods. Thankfully, no major damage, but uh, there was about an hour and a half this morning of scrambling to get windows shut and cats all inside and uh, you know, batting down the hatches, so to speak. Uh, so I'm a little damp and, and chilled this morning, and, and Chris is already into the weather, so hopefully she's all right over the next couple of days. We'll see, but it is time. It's a perfect morning, actually, to do reading because it's, you know, chilly, wet, and rainy, and we just let out the chickens and, and, and stuff, so um, we're going to get into it today. Um, today's Monday's in Middle-Earth episode, we are back to reading the appendices of Lord of the Rings, and we are in, we're still in the section on Gondor and the heirs of Anarion, but there's a section on the stewards of Gondor, which is actually quite a large section when I was skimming through it last week. So I was like, you know what? I think this needs to be its own video. So that's what we're going to be doing today is the stewards of Gondor. Um, kind of be reading through all this um, and seeing you know, some of the history of the stewards and so on and so forth. This is an area upon which I'm fairly vague. You know, obviously I read this years and years and years ago, but I don't really remember a lot of this. So that's what we're going to be going through today. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome. We've been doing this since early 2022. Uh, we went through The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and its entirety, Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King, chapter by chapter, week by week. And now we're going through the appendices. After this, we're going to be doing the Silmarillion. So if that all sounds fun to you, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update. Episodes go live every Monday at around, I think right now we're pushing them around 10 a.m. Uh, Central. That's been about the standard. Um, just every Monday in the morning, they go live. Um, without further ado, let's get into the read-through. So it says here, the house of the stewards was called the house of Hurin, for they were descendants of the steward of King Menardil, Hurin of Emen Arnen, a man of high Numenorean race. It says, after his day, the kings had always chosen their stewards from among his descendants, and after the days of Pelendur, the stewardship became hereditary, as a kingship from father to son or nearest kin. That's very interesting. Um, so the line of, of Denethor came from this, I'm assuming. Uh, we're going to be reading through because one thing Tolkien does a lot of is genealogy. So I'm sure we're going to get a line of, you know, people as we get down here. Um, and much like the king, it says here that the stewards took office with an oath. Um, and it said here, the oath was to hold rod and rule in the name of the king until he shall return. So this is after you remember in the previous, um, it says here, the previous section. So it was that no claimant to the crown could be found who was of pure blood or whose claim all would allow and all feared the memory of the kin strife, knowing that says such dissension uh, would ruin Gondor and it would perish. So it says, as the years lengthened, the stewards continued to rule Gondor, and the crown of Elendil lay in the lap of King Eärnil in the House of the Dead, where Eärnur had left it. So this is just, you know, there's no more kings, no more heirs of Isildur to be found, no more heirs of, uh, of Anarion, or etc., heirs of Elendil. Um, and so the stewards are ruling in their stead. Um, it said here, um, the words of ritual soon became forgotten because the stewards exercised all the powers of the kings and this explains why denethor you know especially the movie version of denethor i mean the book version is still kind of arrogant not kind of definitely an arrogant asshole um but i like the way it was portrayed in the films um i think they did a very good job with the portrayal of denethor um sort of you know looking at Aragorn is this beggar, you know, whose claims are going to have to be, val you know, validated. And even then, why would I follow him? He's just a, you know, ranger from the north, bereft of, you know, lordship, bereft of riches. You know, he's just some, it's like some farm boy, you know. Why would I follow a farm boy? I'm noble birth. I am the steward of Gondor, descended from stewards, you know, like the arrogance of that. But it says here that that started very early on, apparently. Um... It says, though many in Gondor still believe that the king would even return, and some remember the ancient line of the north, uh, which it, it, it said it was rumored still out in the shadows, 
But it says, against such thoughts, the ruling stewards hardened their hearts. They don't want to believe that the king could return because in their minds, you know, we've got the power. Why, why would power corrupts? Why would we want to give up that power? It said, even though, even, even though they thought this is said here, that the stewards never sat on the ancient throne and never wore a crown, nor, nor did they wield a scepter. Only a white rod is a token of their office, and their banner was white without charge. And the, but the royal banner had been sable with a white tree and blossom beneath seven stars. I have that cloak, by the way, in Lord of the Rings Online. I'm going to keep every single last four episodes. All I do is promote Lord of the Rings Online. It's a good game. Go play it. But I have the cloak. I have that cloak. Um, um, the sable cloak with white tree and blossom beneath seven stars on my guardian character. He's a human guardian from Minas Tirith. Wow. Oh. So after Mardil Voronwe, who was reckoned the first of the line, there followed 24 stewards of Gondor until the time of Denethor II, who was the 26th and last. In the early days, there was quiet, known as the Watchful Peace. I guess during this time, Sauron um, was afraid of the White Council, and it says he withdrew his power, and the ringwraiths were hidden in Morgul Vale. Uh, it says here, though, from the time of Denethor the first, there was never full peace again. And even when Gondor had no great or open war, its borders were under constant threat. And that's from Mordor and the south, I'm assuming. Um, in the last years of Denethor, the first Uruks appeared, it says here, out of Mordor. So why is it that I'm thinking that the Uruks were created by Saruman? Is that because of the way the movie version portrayed it? And I just haven't read the books in so long that my memory is faint on that fact. In any case, it says they first appeared out of Mordor and 2475 swept across Ithilien and took Osgiliath. Boromir, son of Denethor. Oh, this is not... Oh, wow. So there was more than one Boromir. This says Boromir, son of Denethor, and this is the first, after whom Boromir of the Nine Walkers was later named, defeated them and regained Ithilien, but Osgiliath was finally ruined. And no people dwelt there afterwards. It says Boromir was a great captain, and even the Witch King feared him. Ah, but he eventually fell in a Mor... Okay, he was eventually stabbed with a Morgul blade, became shrunken with pain, and died twelve years after his father. Oof. Then became the long rule of Sirion, watchful and wary as a ruler. Uh, but it says here the reach of Gondor had grown very short, and he could do little more than defend his borders, while his enemies um, continued to assail him. The Corsairs raided the coasts. But it says here in the north, his chief perils lay in the wide lands of Rovanian between Mirkwood and the river running. A fierce people dwelt wholly under the shadow of Dol Guldur. And they raided the forests until the Vale of Anduin was largely deserted. What did they call them? These Balchoth? Bal Balkohoth? How do you pronounce that? It's Balchoth, I think. Were constantly increased by others of their kind, whereas the people of Kalinad Horn had dwindled. Syrian, sorry, Kyrian was hard pressed. It's Kyrian. I gotta remember it's hard C. Um, hard pressed to hold the line of the Anduin. Says he did foresee the, that future, though, and called for aid out of the north, but it was too late. An army came up out of the north. It says here, uh, however, there came out of the north help beyond hope, and the horns of the Rohirrim were first heard in Gondor with Eol the Young came and coming with his riders and sweeping away the enemy and pursuing the Balchoth to the death over the fields of Canarhorn. Kyrion then granted to Eorl the land to dwell in. He swore to Kyrion the oath of Eorl of friendship and need or to call to the lords of Gondor. This is really cool, by the way, because the film that we're getting, um, The War of the Rohirrim, which is coming, I think, next year, 2024, is all about um, Eorl the Young and that storyline. I cannot wait to see that. I know some people are already like, oh, they're making his, they made a daughter for him and blah, blah, blah. And be entertained, ladies and gentlemen, be entertained. In the days of Beren, the 19th steward, 
it says an even greater peril came upon Gondor. What could be greater? Ah, the fleets of Umbar with the Harad. It says at the same time the Rohirrimors sailed from the west and east and their land was overrun. And they were driven into the dales of the White Mountains. And then in 2758, the long winter began with snow and cold that lasted for almost five months. Helm of Rohan and his, both his sons perished in the war. Uh, and then Baragon, son of Baron, overcame the invaders, sent aid to Rohan. And it says he was the greatest captain that had arisen in Gondor since Boromir I. And when he took over, Gondor began to finally recover its strength for the first time in many, many years. But it took Rohan much longer. And it said here, this is one of the reasons that Baron welcomed Saruman um, and gave him the keys to Orthanc in 2759 um, because he was going to help Rohan. You want to go out, Frodo? Come on. Oh, I just rolled into my bag of kitty food. Come on. No, get out of my... You jumped on my desk, buddy. Come on. <laughs> Cat drama. <laughs> Come on, Frodo. Go outside. You're asking to go. Go on. Mommy's outside doing chores of some type. Hey everyone, Ren Fail here with the uh, commercial part of the video where I say, hey, if you like this, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update. And thanks to all of our supporters are here on YouTube and over on Patreon, our highest members, our guild champions, crazy relative Remy D here on YouTube. And don't forget if you want to support, it's really easy. You can do the memberships below, the Adventurers Guild, three different tiers. There's also the super thanks on any uploaded video or YouTube short that you find. There's also, of course, the super chats and stickers that you could do on any live stream or premiere, and the Patreon page if you want to dive into the fantasy world that I have with my brother and my wife, which is a tabletop game, a point and click adventure game, and a fantasy book series. All are great ways to keep this channel going and me going full time. Thanks again for those of you who support. Let's get back to the video that you're watching now. All right, I'm getting more comfy now. In the days of Baragon, the War of the Dwarves and Orcs was fought in the Misty Mountains from 2793, sorry, 2793 to 39. I read that wrong. From 2793 to 2999, so a war of six years. Instead, only rumors came south of the war until orcs fleeing from Nanduhirion attempted to cross Rohan into the White Mountains. Um, and Rohan attacked and was like, no, we don't want any, we don't want any orcs here. Under Belek Thor II, the 21st steward, the White Tree died when he died. Although it was left standing until the king returns, for no seedlings could be found. Hmm. Then in the days of Turin II, enemies of Gondor began to move again, for Sauron was growing in strength. And it says here he was Almost ready to reveal himself again. The land of Ithilien was infested by Mordor orcs, and pretty much everyone fled west of the Anduin. Um, and it was here that Turin built secret refuge, refu refuges for his soldiers in Ithilien, of which Henneth Anun was the longest garden in man, and he also fortified the Isle of Ker Andros. But he also had the issue with the Haradrim occupying South Gondor. And when Ithilien was invaded in full strength, says King Folkwine of Rohan fulfilled the oath of Errol and repaid his debt for the aid sought by Baragond, sending many men to Gondor. Although he lost both of his sons in battle. Huh. Turgon followed Turin. Not much of his reign is remembered other than the fact that two years before he died, Sauron finally declared himself openly and re-entered Mordor. Baradur was raised again. Mount Doom burst into flame. The last of the folk of Ithilien fled. And Saruman took Isengard for his own and fortified it at this point. Then we get to Ithilien II. Son of Turgon. And it says here he was a man of wisdom. And he began to strengthen his realm against the assault of Mordor. 
Oh. Okay. It says, in much that he did, he had the aid and advice of a great captain whom he loved above all, who was called Thorngil, the eagle of the star, swift and keen-eyed with a silver star upon his cloak. But no one knew his true name, nor on what land he was born. <laughs> he came to Thelion from Rohan, where he had served the king Thingol, but he was not one of the Rohirrim. A great, he was a great leader of men, by land or by sea. But he departed into the shadows whence he came before the days of Ecthelion were ended. I wonder who this could be. <laughs> Thorgil often counseled Ecthelion that the strength of the rebels in Umbor was a great peril to Gondor. And it would be an issue if Sauron moved to open war. He eventually was given leave to gather a small fleet and snuck into Umbar in the middle of the night and burned many of the ships of the Corsairs, overthrew the captain of the Haven in battle, and then ran out. So hit guerrilla warfare, baby. It says, when they came back to Pelargir, to men's grief and wonder, he would not return to Minas Tirith, where great honor awaited him. He instead sent a message of farewell to Ecthelion, telling him, other tasks now call me lord, much time and many perils must pass ere I come to Gondor again, if that be my fate. And nobody could guess what those tasks would be. Um, and no one knew where he went. When he was last seen, his face was towards the mountains of shadow, it says. There was a great dismay at his departure. Ah. Said to all men, it seemed a great loss, unless it were to Denethor, the son of Ecthelion, who was a man now ripe for stewardship, and uh, succeeded the death of his father. He was very proud, Denethor II, Proud, tall, valiant, and more kingly than any man that had appeared in Gondor for many lives of men, wise, far-sighted, and learned in lore, and said he was as like to Thorngil as to one of nearest kin, yet was ever placed second to the stranger in the hearts of men in esteem of his father, Oof. So this begins to um, make more sense to me why he resented. Did he know that Aragorn was... Did they ever find that out, that Aragorn was Thorngil? Hmm. Hmm. Huh. It says here, um, Thorngil had never um, vied with Denethor, nor held himself higher than any servant of his father. And it says here, only one thing really um, differentiated them the two. Thorngil often warned Ecthelion not to put trust in Saruman, but to rather trust in Gandalf the Grey, but Denethor did not like Gandalf. It says, after the days of Ecthelion, there was less welcome for the great pilgrim. It says, therefore, later when all was made clear, many believed that Denethor had discovered... Oh, here it even says here. When all was made clear, many believed that Denethor, who was subtle in mind and looked further deeper than other men, had discovered who this stranger was, Thorangil, and suspected that he and Mithrandir designed to supplant him. Which the speeches that he gives to Gandalf at the end of days, you know, he, that's his obsession is that, you know, you guys are here to supplant me. Wow. So Denethor's wife, Fenduilis, um, but she di says she died after 12 years, withering in the guarded city as a flower of the seaward veils set upon a barren rock. The shadow of Mordor filled her with horror, and she always looked to the sea. It says, after her death, Denethor became more grim and silent than ever, and would sit in his tower alone, deep in thought, for long hours. It was basically consumed by Mordor, because, you know, he's... Yeah, it says here, he dared to look into the Palantir, because he was... He, he began to believe that he needed that knowledge. Um, it says here, none of the stewards previous to him had ever dared to do so. Not even the kings Ernil and Irnur. After the fall of Minas Ithil, when the Palantir of Isildur came into the hands of the enemy, for the stone of Minas Tirith was the Palantir of Anarion, most close in accord with the one that Sauron had taken. So they were everybody was afraid to use it, because like, this one's paired with the other one, and Sauron has the other one. It's not worth the risk. But Denethor was proud enough in his arrogance that he said, I'm strong enough in will that I can handle it. And he did gain gate knowledge from this, apparently. Um... Oh, this is interesting. I didn't know this. He says he bought the Gnarled Steely. I'm going to put this in modern English. So it aged him prematurely. 
says the contest of his will with Sauron basically made him look much older than he was and you know, felt older too. And it says here, pride and despair increased equal fold. Um, and he believed that only single combat between the Lord of the White Tower and the Lord of Barad-dûr. Hang on, I'm reading this again. Until he saw in all the deeds of time. Mm -hmm. And this is when the War of the Ring came. Sons of Denethor grew up. Boromir, beloved by his father. Oh, it says he looked like Denethor, but his heart was much like the kings of like of King Eärendil of old. He took no wife and delighted only in in you know feats of arms and strength. He cared little for lore. Faramir, on the other hand, read the hearts of men as truly as his father. But what he saw moved him to pity rather than scorn, which was his, what was what his father felt. Gentle and bearing, lover of lore and music. And while his courage was just less than his brother's, that was not actually true. And he welcomed Gandalf when he came to the city and learned much from him, which pissed his father off because Denethor hated Gandalf. But it said, despite these differences, the brothers had great love between them, with Boromir acting as the protector and helper of Faramir. No jealousy or rivalry arose between them. Ah, this is so cool. So... I'm getting a little weepy-eyed here. Um, it says here that um, in Faramir's eyes, no man in Gondor could rival his big brother. Heir of Denethor, captain of the White Tower. <laughs> oh, but however, it says here that um, Boromir was a little arrogant about that fact. So it says here, this is what it says, that the, the literal text says, it did not seem possible to Faramir that anyone in Gondor could rival Bor Boromir, heir of Denethor, captain of the White Tower, and of like mind was Boromir. In other words, I am the shit. Like, I am I am a badass. Right, yeah, I am. Hail me, Boromir. <laughs> Which is why he fell to the ring, because he was prideful like his father. I, I'm, I'm a man of Gondor. I have the strength of the blood of Numenor in my veins. I can handle the ring, you know. Why not use it? Why not take it to defeat the the enemy. Um, yeah, it says, of like mind is Baromir, yet it proved otherwise at the test. And the finishing segment here, oh, this is actually the last part of it here. Um, of these, what befell of these three, the War of the Ring, much is said elsewhere. After the war, the ruling stewards came to an end because... Uh, the return of the king, you know, Aragorn came back and the kingship was renewed and the standard of the White Tower flew once more from the Tower of Ecthelion. So cool. Oh, the next part is um, here follows a part of the tale of Aragorn and Arwen. So is this the I'm just reading ahead a little bit. This is the part where they talk about the kid that they have. And oh, no, this is when they're. Oh, this is I don't I, I don't remember all of this. This is when. Of their youth and when he met Arwen. So I wonder if this is... It just says a part of the tale. Anyway, that's next week's... Um, there's a lot more in these appendices than I thought there was. I don't I don't remember it being this much detail. I remembered a lot of genealogy. I did remember there being the Arwen and stuff because I remember it talks about, like, I think, I think it talks about the end when Aragorn passes and she, you know, wastes away waiting for him, you know, longing for him and stuff. It's a very sad ending but they did have a happy life together. That's next week. Like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. See you next time, everybody.